Welcome to Ngubani 7th Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, would love to welcome you at the comfort of your home, wherever you are streaming live. We are excited today, once again, to be coming to you with this lecture. And we believe strongly that today's lecture is going to awaken you and impact your life positively. We wish uh, uh, quickly to invite you and your friends to subscribe to our social media platforms uh, on YouTube at Ungubani, uh, on Facebook as Ungubani Movement, on Instagram as Ungubani underscore movement. And please engage to us, talk to us. We want to hear what you feel, what are you benefiting, even your questions on all the lectures that we have gone through. Without the waste of time, ladies and gentlemen, once again today I wish to introduce our beloved speaker, uh, who is the founder of Atlas L Group, a wisdom counselor to all mankind, a businessman, a brand strategy curator, an author, an Ungubani 360 degrees coach. His mission is to inspire individuals to become balanced and impactful leaders who are good stewards of talent, of time, of money, of self-actualization, and everyday life. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Ngobi W. Nyembe Kantombela, the label that speaks. Sweet. Let me take this opportunity, as Uzuit had said, and welcome all of you who are tuning live and who are streaming wherever you are watching us and enjoying this lecture. This truly has been an amazing journey, and we appreciate your visits that you've done and the fact that you are with us as we go along. The seventh lecture, we've titled it, Time is Your Greatest Investment, Trade It Wisely. Time is Your Greatest Investment, Trade it wisely. First, let me start with paying tribute to those who made time a hallmark. I pay tribute to Charles Babbage, the man who founded the first computer. He is one of the mathematics uh, lecturers uh, who was respected in the century, 18th, 18th century. And in him being respected in the 18th century, he founded what is now a great invention, a computer. Let me pay tribute and homage to Guido da Vigiano and Leonardo da Vinci, who founded or invented the first car. First cars started as wind-driven vehicles and tricycles, but it needed people who understood that you could push the boundary of invention until you perfected to the electric cars that we have these days. Let me pay homage and tribute to Linthetal and the Wright brothers who founded the first plane. In fact, I'm interested in the story of Otto Linthetal because he inspired the Wright brothers to build their first aeroplane. Apparently, he glided on a hill in a big kite-like thing called a hang glider. The brothers really like this idea because they had a toy that their father had bought them, which they called the bat. The bat could glide and do amazing things, and they said this probably could be something worth looking into. They thought about something that could fly, like an aeroplane, but they knew that they had few problems to overcome for them to come up with a plane that would work. These were some of the requirements. It needed to have wings so that it can lift in the air. It needed to have something to propel it, but they needed something to control this aeroplane. And therefore, inventions went on and on so that they give us an aeroplane to this day. Let me pay homage and tribute to Hendrik Hetz or Guglielmo Marconi, who gave us the first radio. Think about it. When you look at just the causing of spark to leap across a gap, that those can gener generate an electromagnetic waves it's just amazing to think of, and today we have what we call radio. These are men and women who impacted history of time greatly. They started their inventions anew with nothing to mimic 
except mimicry itself. They use this as the foundation of inventions that they've given us over time. They believe that something could come out of nothing as long as they were up to something. And these are people that they lived, and for us to know that they live, we don't need their tombstones, but we can look at their creation. People who live to make sure that whatever they created has become the monument and the hallmark of time. These are men and women who today are regarded as mothers and fathers of their own theories and own inventions. They were independent thinkers who looked at life with a how can I make life better time, how can I make life better with the time that I have question. In other words, these are people who saw time and, saw, and time saw them through. Every time I study the age of the earth, I cannot help but think about such people. Key individuals who've played a crucial role in pushing the boundaries of civilization. Individuals who've traded their time well, and as a result, time has kept them in eternal memory. This includes key individuals who've contributed so much that their lives are, are treated as part of and regarded as the hallmark of time. Not that they were different from us, because they invested their time wisely. That's all. I must say that again. It's not that they were different from us, but because they invented or invested their time wisely. What am I saying? Charles Babbage was a human, probably so is you. Lillian Ondethal was a human, so is you. The Wright brothers were human, so is you. What marks time, though, what marks the hallmark of time is when you realize that you are here for more than just mere existence, that you are here to give life and the universe solutions to the problems we face, or problems of the day. For me, these are men and women that must be regarded and saluted, people that we must celebrate because their existence is more than just being in the grave or having died. It's people that have pioneered amazing objects and inventions. Think about the compass, which now assists people to get direction or not get lost. Think about the printing press, which has assisted in spreading news all around the world. Think about the internal combustion engine, which has powered locomotives and vehicles Think about the telephone, which has co connected um, civilizations and generations and people in different places. Think about the light bulb, which has given light to humans. Think about the computer algorithm, which has mastered that you put something on a computer and it's coded as communication that you can send as an email or as a recording. Think about the internet, which has made the world to be boundless so that you are even watching me through the very internet and many other significant and historical landmark inventions. These, for me, are things that we must always appreciate because these are people who decided they're going to be creators of their realities, people who decided that they're going to be markers of time, people who decided that they're going to be makers of great inventions, people who decided that they're going to be solutions and not be problems, people who decided that for things to happen, they too needed to put it on wheels through their creation. Sadly, today, we see more of recycling. People take one thing and keep making more and more and improving it more and more. There's nothing wrong with improvement, but we need people who are going to create us. People who are going to be creators, who start things from scratch. People who start things by looking at a problem, who then say, what solution can I have? For me, these are men and women that will be remembered forever because they impacted our lives greatly. These are men and women that even if we may try and forget them, history would remember them because of their creation. Time is remarkable. It is the distinct and dynamic measure of nature. They say to understand time and its effect, you must not look at it from a year, a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute. To understand time, you must look at it in terms of a passing second. It is amazing how much lots can happen in a split second. On average, 4.5 cars are manufactured in a second. 2,000 square meters of forest is wiped out in a second. Three people are born in a second. 1.5 people die in a second. 
million cubic meters of water falls as precipitation in a second. In a single second, 2.4 million red blood cells are produced in our bone marrow, and 4 billion impulses are exchanged between the cortical hemispheres of our brain. A lot happens in a second. For me, time is the most central piece in the puzzle called life. We all have time, and we all answer to time, whether we like it or not. Notwithstanding the significance of time, there are still those of us who still fail to understand the actual meaning and importance of their own time. In most cases, we define time by its nature and by how we relate to it. If you ask a person what time is it, one person may look at a wristwatch and give you a digital reading of the time, another person may tell you it's time to sleep or time to eat, and both of them are right. The English Chambers de defines time as the continuous passing and succession of minutes, days, and years. Yet this doesn't really tell us what time is at all. It just tells us how humans have measured time. Augustine once asked, what is time? If no one asks me, I know, but if any person should require me to tell him, I cannot. Even scientists have tried to define time. Einstein's law of relativity Though could not deliver the comprehensive definition, it came close. Every time you try and define time, you have to consider the origin of the earth, which will compel you to discuss what was before the beginning. And I don't think this lecture is intended to unravel such. The definition of time and the battle of time continues between scientists and philosophers as long as academics, history can remember. And as you read the texts that follow, you'll also realize the heftiness of such a debate. Sir Walter Raleigh, a poet, says, even such is time that takes in trust our youth, our joys, our all we have, and pays us but with earth and dust, who in the dark and silent grave, when we've wandered all our ways, shuts up the store of our days, but from this earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up. Say Isaac Newton, a scientist, says, as long as motion is governed by mixed immutable equations, so then is our life on earth predestined. And we run through our lives as cogs and gears in a mechanical clockwork, inevitably doing what these equations of motion force us to do. We have no free will, and the past, present, and future is just an apparition. Aristotle, a philosopher, says, out of nothing, nothing comes. Gabriela Veneziano, a physicist, says, what was God doing before he created the world? Augustine answered, time itself being part of God's creation, there was simply no before. Joseph Booth, a cultural theologian, says, even we can imagine looking on events that happened thousands of light years ago. A light year is a measure of distance defined by the distant light, light travels in one year. If we could look through a telescope from a star 1,000 light years from Earth, then we could witness the events of the 10 of the previous millennium. If we could travel from star to star, then we could experience a certain contemporaneousness of all past events. Yet God's time is an eternal contemporaneousness. He sees all time as one. All these are the different theories and ideologies that suffices when one looks into the subject of time. Time is very difficult for us to comprehend, though man continues to contemplate about the same. As human beings, we seem not able to escape the entangle of time without entering into the debate about time. This being the truth and my intentions, being not to get involved in such a useless debate, then it is fair to look at time in relation to the things we do and at least with that, we can define time as the period within which things happen. The period within which things happen. The period within which things happen. That is time. I think it was Zola Shabalala, a former Miles and Associates Love Life Fellow, who proposed this definition during a resounding presentation on time many years ago. Time as the period within which things happen. Time can stand still, by the way, because of events that are happening 
in that period. Remember when time stood still for a single nation? On the 11th of September, 20, 2001, we experienced, and America experienced what is called 9-11, when World Trade Center and the Pentagon were attacked. Four planes were hijacked. Two attacked the World Trade Center, one attacked the Pentagon, and another one, they are saying it was going to the White House, but it crashed on its way there. Hijacked by Al-Qaeda, which was confirmed later by Osama bin Laden that they were responsible for such, time stood still in America. I mean, think about it. 2,977 people died. Over 25,000 were injured. And the substantial long-term consequences in terms of health for those who were injured, some still live with it to this day. But it's not only a city or a country or a state that can have a time standing still. I just went through recently over a boxing fight when time stood still for a single man. Apparently, on the 21st of September, 1991, Chris Eubank faced Michael Watson. Michael Watson had tried to fight and gain the world title three times fighting the same man. Just three months before that, he had tried, and they say he was robbed on points, and referees made Chris Eubank to sustain his title. Watson came this time three months later, having exercised, and he was ready to give it all he had. He stepped on the ring, and as he fought this man, he was leading on points when you look at how fast and how cool and how quick his punches were. On the 11th round, at some point, he knocks Eubank down and with an overhand punch. And they were thinking, he's got it. But Eubank quickly rushes up. His coach says he moved like a warrior. It must have been that he was like a warrior when he moved. And he put a strong uppercut on Watson's face. That single punch sent Watson to doomsday on doomsland. He spent 40 days in a coma and had six brain operations to remove a blood clot just from a single punch. Just from a single punch. In fact, they are saying after regaining his consciousness, he spent over a year in intensive care and he was being rehabilitated on how to hear and how to speak and how to walk. And for six years, he was a wheelchair user. I like what his surgeon says about him. He says he had never seen such a remarkable act from a single man. A single punch, 40 days of coma, and six years in a wheelchair. Lao Tzu says time is a created thing. To say I don't have time is to say I don't want to. Let's play a little game with you, if we can. Say you receive a phone call right now, and a banker is calling you from a famous bank in the country, and he says, hello, say hello, ma'am. We've decided that every day in the next seven days, we will give you 86,400 rands to spend. You can't save it. You can't put it away, you can't invest it, you must use it all in that single day because whatever you do not use in that day will be forfeited the following day. What will you do with 86,400 rands? I've played this game with many people in trainings and conferences and people say things like, I'll build my mommy house, I'll buy myself a sport car, I'll put deposit on a land and design something, I'll travel. I'll finish my qualification or degree. People can do so many things. What would you do with 86,400 rands given every day? That you must use it all on that day for seven consecutive days. Think about it. Every day you and I are given 86,400 seconds. Take 60 seconds, multiply by 60 minutes, 
multiply by 24 hours, you get to 86,400. That's the amount of seconds you have every day. What are you doing with your 86,400 seconds? Are you spending it with your mom, your dad, your parents? Are you spending it with your family? Are you spending your time traveling? Are you spending your time studying? Are you spending your time doing that which you think you were born to do? Because believe it or not, every day you are given the same amount of share of 86,400 seconds. And whatever you don't use today is forfeited the following day. You start on a clean slate. Like everything created, the earth is ever growing and everything about it revolves around time. If you study the rocks, time becomes an effect mechanism and you'd realize that the longer the time in years, the stronger the rocks as layers of the earth. Which means the layers of the earth are a tribute to time. The trees of the land are the significance of time. How wide or deep the river is, is the question of time. How old or young the creation is the mark of time. To understand the earth and its form, including time as a consequence, you must set out to understand self. Not so much what you are going through, but how you are actualizing self in relation to time. Your existence and time are intertwined. You live in time and you live at a time. There are five key principles of time that I'm going to call Ungubani key principles of time that I want to discuss shortly, that I've personally come to learn about life. The first principle, time is the most perishable commodity on earth. Time is the most perishable commodity on earth. What time is it right now? Time is, as I'm about to announce time, seconds are tick-tocking and moving. Time is perishable. The time you have, you're not guaranteed you forever have. What was yesterday and what was last week and what was last month and what was last year is different to what is today, what will be tomorrow, what will be next week and what will be next month and what will be next year. But remember, time is perishable. How do I know time is perishable? It is moving. In other words, it moved from more you had at the beginning of an hour. You had 60 minutes. By the end of the hour, you have nothing. And another hour opens up and so it perishes. How are you going to mark your time as it perishes? Because whether you do something with it or you sleep, time will continue to perish. The second principle of time, you make a decision, time passes, and your future is sealed. So be careful of, of time. When stimuli happens to you, Remember, it is happening in time and at a time. If you're driving, for instance, and there's a road rage, someone drives badly in front of you, that is something they are doing to you as a stimuli. If you get carried away, you may leave the, your car and go and fight them, but what you are doing, you are now engaging time that is passing, and you are sealing your future because as it happened somewhere in Santin, a man tried to go into somebody who had driven badly in front of them, and that person was removed dead on the scene, shot dead. You make a decision, time passes, and your future is sealed. What decisions are you making right now? How are you passing your time, and how are you sealing your future? That that principle of time is tick-tock, time lost, can never be regained. Hmm. Even if you're in a wrong relationship, you're still investing time. Even if you're staying longer in a relationship, deceiving and lying, you're still enjoying and moving time. But I'm telling you, whether your time was spent doing something amazing or something horrible, that time can never be regained. Not only does time perish, principle one, but time can be lost. So those then who invent using their time are capturing time. 
When you spend time loving your partner, you are capturing time because in the memory of your love, you are marking that time as significant. In other words, you are gaining time because that memory you would remember. In you going to spend time with your friends in a weekend, you are capturing, capturing time so that you are not losing that time, but you are keeping it in memory. This hour you are spending with us right now, enjoying this seventh lecture, you are capturing time so that time is not lost. How is then time lost? It is lost when you are doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing or you know you're not intending to do. Being in a wrong mission, involved in a wrong purpose, doing a wrong job or something that you hate, staying in something that doesn't benefit you, staying in a business that makes you lose money, all those things then are making you lose certain things about life and therefore you are losing time. You will never regain them. The fourth principle of time, you can mark time in memory by what you do in its stead. You can mark time in memory by what you do in its stead. In other words, when it is 7 o'clock in the morning, instead of watching time at 7 o'clock, when you jump out of your blanket, cold as it may be, you are doing something instead of 7 o'clock. You are waking up. What are you going to do to mark time? Think about it. Sometimes we forget what people have done to us, but what we don't forget is the period in which they did it. You hear somebody say, hey, last year was hard. Or three years ago, someone cheated on me. In other words, you were marking time. And therefore, you were marking time in memory of what you were doing. How are you going to mark time in memory of what you must do? The last principle, fifth principle of time is, whatever you do not have, it is because you are not willing to exchange your time for it. This is an indictment. I must say it again. Whatever you do not have, it is because you are not willing to exchange your time for it. I can't play piano. It is not because I'm not able to. I've never spent time in front of a piano. I'm not a marathon person. I haven't done any single marathon. I see people doing comrades, and I look at them, and I wish I could, but I can't. I've never invested time running. Whatever you do not have, it is because you are not willing to exchange your time for it. Think about it. If you're uneducated, you didn't give your time to education. If you're poor then, you didn't spend your time addressing your poverty. Because what you have is time. And time can be exchanged. Remember, you can do something in time stead, or in the stead of time, you can do something else. So in other words, somebody who has friends, don't envy them. Remember, they did something with their time. They exchanged their time. In other words, they gave their time, and in return, they received relationships or relating. To understand creation, you must pay attention to time. There is a lot to learn from the earth about things in time and things out of time. That change is the figure of time, and change happens because of time. That logic is built with reference to time, and whether or not it makes sense is the subject of time. That reality from dreams is the subject of time, and anything that has no time has no existence. There are 365.24 days in a calendar year, 366 in a leap year. As per the Julian calendar, which was introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, each day is different from the rest. What you did yesterday, what you do today, and what you'll do tomorrow carry with it the value and meaning of your own time, and thus the meaning of your life. Your birth is the reason enough to prove that you have something to contribute to life, and you'll be remembered for your contributions. So make it count. Make your time count. Invest your time. We know that on earth there are billions of human beings, 7.8 billion as of March 2020 to be precise, 
with a 1.1% annual growth rate as estimated, and each person with their individual uniqueness, which is our supreme self's imprimatur that says, I created you and your life is now. It took over two million years of human prehistory and history, we are told, for the world population to reach one billion people, and only 200 years more to reach seven billion. Time had already been started, and once time had found its rhythm, time moved quicker for people to multiply themselves. Time seems to be going by, by pretty fast. Or maybe human civilization has gained more speed. Either way, time will tell. Remember that everything you'll ever create is carried in the promise of time. By just how you invest your time, you're already distinguishing self from the rest. Invest your time wisely. Invest your time wisely. Treat your time as a seed that if you plant in the right environment and at the right time, you'll create a good harvest out of your time. You'll create a good harvest out of your time. Time is your greatest investment and your source of everything. We've seen how civilized men have created their political, economical, social, technological, environmental, and legal realities using time. Look how America's fortune was threatened in its 2003 war with Iraq and the, the chaotic aftermath, including the financial crash of 2008, the 9-11 tragedy I started with, and the Black Lives Matter cry for one of its minority groups. Look how America ch was challenged and changed during President Trump's presidency. Time can turn things around just like that. Even for the world's greatest democracy, founded on the greatest faith with the greatest dream like America, time can change. How do you have a successful life? Many successful years. How do you have a successful year? 12 successful consecutive months. How do you have a successful month? Four to five consecutive successful weeks. How do you have a successful week? Seven consecutive successful days. How do you have a successful day? 24 consecutive successful hours. How do you have a successful hour? 60 consecutive successful minutes. And how do you have a minute? 60 consecutive successful seconds. And how do you have a successful second? It's up to you. What do you do at this second right now? We are all imbued with one thing in common, time, which you can invest however we see fit and almost be guaranteed we'll have an uncommon end every time. All of the masters I've come to investigate have used their time as pundit and distinct compared to their peers at any given time. It's as if they committed their daily lives to nothing but mastery through actualization. It's like they knew they were created for a grind and their grind was focused and deliberate towards that one thing and one thing only. I have two clan brothers who are twins, Pumlani and Mpumzeni Nyembe. They're identical twins, so identical that they look alike, they dress alike. They went everywhere and they've been everywhere together. They went to the same primary school, same high school, and I'm told by them that in most times they even sat on the same desk as twins. So identical that if you don't know them carefully, you could confuse them. But even if they have been so identical in how they've grown up, they still are different in the end. Even though they've had the same amount of time given to them on earth, they've been they've turned out differently. For instance, what's different about them is that their physique in terms of appearance is not the same. One is bigger and one looks slimmer. The other thing is that one went to IT and one went to finance or cost accounting. The other one who went to IT is now busy with his law or LLB degree. That's how different they've turned out to be. They may have kids, but actually they've got the different kids 
and the different kids have got different ages and those kids are not the same in terms of amount or how many kids they've had. One has three, one has just had, has just had a small baby now, which means it's two. Though they're identical, and though they've had the same amount of time on earth, they've turned out differently. They got married on the same day, and they wear the same clothes, but even their marriages have turned out differently because their investment of time is not necessarily the same. Time is what distinguishes us from others. Your life will come to be measured by the things you invest your time in. Not only the things that consume your thoughts and feelings, but those things that determine your behavior as well. The question is, what would you come to master? You can choose to master things of life. You can choose to master life of things. You can choose to master either mas things or life. It's your call and you'll answer to such by what occupies your time. It is my hope that self-mastery, therefore, will be at the center of your decision and pursuit. The most interesting thing about failing to master things is that things will master you as consequences. What do I mean? If you fail to master punctuality, then late coming will master you. If you fail to master actions, then stimulus reaction will master you, or lack of action. If you fail to master your character, then your personality will master you. If you fail to master your tongue, then your chin work will master you, where you must apologize all the time. If you fail to master your relationships, then breakups will master you. If you fail to master trust, then skepticism will master you. If you fail to master assurance, then doubt will master you. It's as discernible as that. Again, I ask you, what would you come to actualize and master? It seems like even the medical journals concur that people who have nothing to do live, live, live their lives in a, in, in a deteriorating manner. In other words, they deteriorate more because they are not active and they deteriorate faster than most. When you don't expose your mind to knowledge, your mind shrinks, shrinks, and you could meet somebody who's so stupid and you think, what happened to you? They didn't spend time reading. When you don't spend your time with people, you could be so isolated, and by being isolated, you could feel so alone and so lonely, and so lonely that you could actually take your own life or find your life meaningless. For me, the greatest mastery is the appreciation of self. It's the knowledge that by mastering me, I'm helping you. Because by mastering me, then I'm making myself a solution to the world. By mastering me, then I'm making myself productive in the world. By mastering me, then I'm having myself a collaborator in the world. If you don't master self, and you become disruptive, or you become a distraction, then your life may end in prison. Then you may end up being murdered or killed because you didn't master self. So self is the best place to start in investing your time. Invest your time on you. Maybe you're wondering at some of the things you can, self yourself, you can set yourself out to master. You can master a skill, like if you want to learn how to play a musical instrument. You can master an ability, say you want to become the world's greatest communicator. You can master a field, say you want to become a best mathematician. You can master a role, say you want to become the world's number one mom or dad. You can master a discipline, say you want to become the best in aviation control. You can master a code, say you want to become the best tennis player. You can master a faculty, say you want to become the best economist. You can master a job, say you want to become the best operator. Yes, you could master almost anything. One of the unknown quotes says, opportunity dances with those already on the dance floor. Opportunity dances with those already on the dance floor. Time will grant you opportunities. Take them. Don't worry too much about instant benefits. Sometimes you'll be expected to volunteer and give your time for free and give the best of who you are for free in order to, to enter the dance floor of life which will improve your chances of snowballing your productivity. Improve your life, work on yourself. Don't look at what you are getting, 
but look at what you are giving. Because if you are giving time and you are giving yourself, then you become greater and you become more. Make sure that what you are giving is a full measure of your time. Don't do things half passionately. Don't commit less or half or minimally. Give it your all or don't do it at all. Take time to know yourself. I pray that you have the greatest encounter with yourself. Your birth. Your origin. Your humanity. Your lineage and ancestry. Your spirituality. Your true self. Your universe and universalism. Your ultimate calling. I pray that you have the greatest encounter with Obabam Kulubako, your elders and those who came before you, with Abakapile, your guards, with Abakumile, your archangels, with Abakubizile, Nogbizele, your supreme calling, with Indelayako, coming to terms with your calling, with Uksasalako, your future, Nenguna Pagatelako, your eternity. I pray that your own charity begins at your own home before you can change the world, to learn how to spend quality time with your own children, to learn how to spend quality time with your own siblings, to learn how to spend quality time with your extended family, people of your clan and your community, to read, to debate, to play chess. Oh, well, I do. <laughs> One day you'll stand before a judge and motion in Lemin at a pre-trial request that certain inadmissible evidence of time not be referred to or offered at trial. I hope this lecture serves as preliminary hitherto and your request is thrown out of the court of life. Because now you know that when you stand and motion in Lemin, you can no longer say, I wasn't ready, I didn't know, I didn't have enough, I wasn't enough, because you can use time to alter and change all of that. I pray inter alia that you come to learn about and commit yourself to what is in the art of war is called strong action, which is training the body without being burdened by the body, exercising the mind without being used by the mind, working in the world without being affected by the world, carrying out tasks without being obstructed by tasks, and by strong action on the way, one can bring the body to the realm of longevity, bring the mind to the sphere of mystery, and bring the world, of, and, and bring the world to greater peace, and bring tasks to great fulfillment. I urge you to use your time to assess five things well as per Lao Tzu's strategy. The way, the weather, the terrain, the leadership, and discipline. The way means inducing the people to have the same aim as the leadership so that they will share death and share life without fear of danger. The weather means the seasons to understand that everything happens good and is best in its time. The terrain is to be assessed in terms of distance, difficulty, or ease of travel, dimension, and safety. To know that the distance you're gonna take depends on the terrain that is. To prepare your fitness in the terrains of life you're gonna travel. Leadership is a matter of intelligence, trustworthiness, humanness, courage, and sternness. Reliance on intelligence alone will result in rebelliousness. Exercise of humanness alone will result in weakness. Fixation on trust alone is folly. Dependence on the strength of courage results in violence. Excessive sternness of command results in cruelty. When one has all five virtues all together, each appropriate to its function, then one can be a leader. Disciplines means organization, chain of command, and logistics. Organize yourself, be in your own command, so that you can tell yourself when to go and when to stop, when to start something and when to stop it before it addicts you or you're addicted to it. But logistics then speaks about the means to an end. People could serve in your logistics. My grandmother Ugogo used to say, a person who's a good friend can travel from Wanongoma to Cape Town without a cent in their purse because you'll ride the friendships and relationships you've built. Those are part of logistics. Lao Tzu says deep knowledge 
is to be aware of disturbance before it disturbance, to be aware of danger before danger, to be aware of destruction before destruction, and to be aware of calamity before calamity. By deep knowledge of principle, one can change disturbance into order, change danger into safety, change destruction into survival, change calamity into fortune. Life is the art of war. Time is the art of existence. Self is the art of timing. It was Albert Einstein who once observed that in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. This is so true. When your life gets more difficult, more opportunities are created. I've had to carry the rest of my life and the rest of my family on my shoulders in the recent months. This may be difficult years, but such has also changed and expanded my life. I may have given more, but I've certainly become more. I didn't say gain more, I've become more. By becoming more, I'm now able to inspire more. This lecture itself is both of the scars and what I've gained as more. I'm using my time to invest in myself and my people. Use time to build everything and anything you want. Use time to build your personality. Use time to build your character. Use time to build your strengths. Use time to build your skills. Use time to build your knowledge. Use time to build your, your experiences. Use time to build relationships that are lasting. Use time to improve yourself. And all these incremental and deliberate acts will one day grow into a remarkable self, a remarkable character, a remarkable career, a remarkable life. With a remarkable self, a remarkable character, a remarkable career, and a remarkable life, I'm sure success will come. Here I'm talking about the best and the most of success. It's all up to you and the quality and quantity of time you are prepared to trade in exchange for anything you want. Ufunani, what do you want? Start trading your time wisely. Umubani, join the movement. In the end, timing is everything. If you want to know the value of a second, ask a pedestrian who just avoided a car accident. If you want to know the value of a minute, ask someone who just missed a flight. If you want to know the value of an hour, ask a couple who just gave birth. If you want to know the value of a day, ask a family who has no food to eat. If you want to know the value of a week, ask someone whose child is missing. If you want to know the value of a month, ask an employee serving notice. If you want to know the value of a year, ask a political administration that misappropriates funds on, fruit, on fruitless and wasteful expenditure. In the end, I like Abraham Lincoln's study in the popular Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He did a resounding theory of qualitative method called biographical analysis. He began by picking out a group of people, some historical figures, some people he knew, whom he felt clearly met the standard of self-actualization, were included in the august group that he put together. This group included Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jane Addams, William James, Albert Schweizner, Benedict Spinoza, Aldous Huxley, and 12 unnamed people who were alive at the time that Maslow knew to do his research. He then looked at their biographies, their writings, the acts of the world, and the words that they spoke. From these sources, he developed a list of qualities that seemed characteristic of these people, as opposed to the great mass of us. He called them the self-actualizers. He found a few things that one, self-actualizers were reality-centered which means they could differentiate what is fake and dishonest from what is real and genuine. They were problem-centered, meaning they treated life's difficulties as problems demanding solutions, not as personal troubles to be railed or surrendered, or surrendered to. They had a different, a different perception of means and ends. They felt that the ends didn't necessarily justify the means, that the means could be the ends in themselves, and that the means, the journey, was often more important than the ends, which is the destination. They also had a different way of relating to others. First, they enjoyed solitude and were comfortable being alone. And they enjoyed deeper personal relationships with a few close friends and family members, rather than more shallow relationships with many people. They enjoyed autonomy, a relative independence from physical and social needs. 
and they resisted enculturation. That is, they were not susceptible to social pressure to be well adjusted or fit in. They were in fact non-conformist in the best sense. They had an unhostile sense of humor, preferring to joke at their own expense or at the human condition and never directing their humor at others. They had a quality called acceptance of self and others by which it meant that these people would be more likely to take you as you were rather than to try and change you into what they thought you could be. This same acceptance ap applied to their attitudes towards themselves. If some quality of theirs wasn't, was, was, wasn't harmful, they let it be, even enjoying it as a personal quirk. On the other hand, they often strongly motivated themselves to change their negative attitudes. Along with them comes spontaneity and simplicity. They preferred being themselves rather than being pretentious or artificial. In fact, for all their nonconformity, he found that they tended to be conventional on the surface, just, were, just, just they were self, self actualized and nonconformist. Because all of us tend to conform, but these ones were not conformers. Further, he found that they had a sense of humility and respect towards others, something Maslow also called democratic values, meaning that they were open to ethnic and individual variety even treasuring it. They had a quality Maslow called human kinship or um, social interest, compassion, humanity. And this was accompanied by strong ethics, which was spiritual but seldom conventionally religious in nature. And these people had a certain freshness or appreciation and ability to see things, even ordinary things, with wonder. Along with this comes the ability to be creative, inventive, and original. The last thing that he found is that they had more peak experiences than average person. A peak experience is one that takes you out of yourself, that makes you feel very tiny or very large to some extent, to feel that you are one with nature and one with life and one with God. It gave them a feeling of being part of the infinite and the eternal. Their experiences would leave a mark on a person and change them instead for better and they were actively seeking out these experiences or peak experiences. Self-actualizers are masters of self-cardinals. The actualization is aimed at mastery more than specialization. Self-actualization, therefore, is self-mastery. It's a form of awakening, more a journey of self-consciousness than a destination. And as such, you can never say you've arrived, but you must definitely start. Not just start, Start and never stop. In fact, start now. Unguban is a journey and not a destination. Self-actualization is a constant and never-ending battle until we die. One moment you are high in the sky and the next moment your wheels come off. Such is life and a journey towards your, your ultimate self. It's got highs and it's got lows. Even with a three million US dollars net worth like Casper Nioverst, a 10 million rent creep with a cigar lounge and four garages and other luxurious homes, cars totaling 9.4 million, including two Bentleys, two Mercedes Benz, and a Rolls Royce, among others, millions of rents worth of endorsement deals. He just signed now 100 million with Grip, a following that can fill up domes and stadiums, including a whooping 3 million plus Twitter followers, being the envy of Africa and having traveled the world, you can still get confused in one of his tracks. And there's nothing wrong with that, because life is no child's play. In fact, life is hard, particularly at certain times in one's life, and especially where good times have been poorly handled. Time is your greatest investment, and I hope from now on you'll begin to trade it wisely. Join the movement. Join Umubani. Visit more of our lectures and understand that even when you feel small, go to the first lecture and remind yourself I was created from a stock that cannot be contained. Though you feel like your life has come to an end or you are struggling with your life, go to the second lecture and use your today to change your yesterday to improve your tomorrow. But also, when you feel like your identity is a crisis, go to a third lecture where we confirm that identity is a continuous and never-ending struggle. Continue in these lectures. Continue immersing yourself in this knowledge. But I hope 
now on, you realize these are not just lectures, but these are life-changing moments. And I can promise you, with the team at Ungubani, we can promise you this. Though we are trying to change your life, it's changing our lives more. Ungubani has been the best for us ever. We celebrated 13 businesses on a Tuesday. And I'm saying again, we celebrated 13 businesses on a Tuesday. Why was this done? Why this was done because we realized living life just in competition is not enough. We must collaborate. We must work together. And I hear that some people right now are blaming the rest of Africa and the rest of the world for the ills and what they're struggling with. I wish we can stop now, and I hope we do stop now and realize we can't be fighting white people anymore. We can't be fighting men when we are women anymore. We can't be fighting exes and those who've left us anymore. We can't be fighting haters as if our lives depend on haters. We must actually realize we all have the time, and with the time we have, we can do whatever we want to do, or do nothing. I hope then that you take the time to do something. And as you do something, realize your time is now, and your time has just started. Use it, use it wisely, and we appreciate you. Thank you.